We are honored to have with us a Nobel laureate, Professor Michael Spence, Stanford University, as our distinguished chair, and Dr. V. Anant Nagar Nageshwaran, Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India, Professor T.C.A. T. Anand, former Chief of Statistician of India and Secretary of Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Mosby, Professor Rohinton Medhora, Chairman on the Board of Institute for New Economic Thinking, New York, and Professor Rob Johnson, President, INET, New York, as a panelist alongside Ms. Sunanda Nayar Bedkar, Director, Strategic Planning, South Asia, INET, we also have with us on dais Professor Ram Singh, Director, Delhi School of Economics, as the moderator for today's discussion. I request Professor Ram Singh and Professor Sudha Vasil, Head of Sociology Department at the Delhi School of Economics, to fac facilitate the distinguished guest on the dais. Professor Spence. <laughs> First, we have Professor Michael Spence, born in 1943 in Montclair, New Jersey, USA. Michael Spence is a distinguished economist known for his groundbreaking work in the field of asymmetric information in markets. In 2001, he was awarded the Sveris Rix Bank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for his pioneering research. The core of Michael Spence's work revolves around the analysis around the analysis of markets with asymmetric information, a concept that lies at the heart of economic theory. He developed the theory of signaling, a revolutionary idea that shed light on how individuals with superior knowledge in a market can effectively communicate their information to those with less insight. This impact reverberating across sectors and industries. Second, we have Professor Rohinton Medhora. Rohinton P. Medhora has served as on INET's board since 2012 and is a distinguished fellow and former president of the Center for International Governance Innovation 2012 to 2022. He has also served on CIGI's former International Board of Governors from 2009 to 2014. Previously, he was vice president of programs at Canada's International Development Research Center. His fields of expertise are monetary and trade policy, international economic relations, and development economics. Robinton received his doctorate in economics in 1988 from the University of Toronto, where he subsequently taught. Next, we have Professor Rob Johnson. Rob Johnson is the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, INET which he co-founded with William Janeway and James Batsley in 2009. For over a decade, Johnson has convened global initiatives with the greatest economic minds of our time, including conferences around the world, from Bretton Woods to Hong Kong, the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, in partnership with academics, business leaders, policy makers and NGOs, the Young Scholars Initiative, New Economic Thinking Curriculum, and online courses with leading scholars like Michael Sandel and Perry Medling, and groundbreaking research projects that challenge economic orthodoxy. He served on the United Nations Commissions of Experts on IMF under the chairmanship of Joseph Silges, and has also taught as an adjunct professor at the Union Theological Seminary and at SIPA at Columbia University. Next, we have Dr. V. Anant Nageshwaran. Prior to his appointment as the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India in January 2022, Dr. V. Anant Nageshwaran was a writer, author, teacher, and consultant. He has written a weekly Mint column for 15 years on Tuesday since 2007 and has co authored four books on topics ranging from finance, derivatives, and the growth potential of India. He was one of the founders of the Avishkar Venture Capital Fund and the Takshashila Institution and has served on the Ad Academic Advisory Board of DAV Schools in Tamil Nadu and the Indian School of Public Policy. He was also a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India from 2019 to 2021. In 1985, he received a postgraduate diploma in management from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and earned his doctoral degree from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in 1994 for his work on exchange rate behavior. 
We now have Professor T.C.A. Anant. Professor T.C.A. Anant retired as member of the UPSC on Jan 2nd, 2023. Prior to joining the UPSC, Professor Anant was professor and head of the Department of Economics at Delhi School of Economics. He has been the Chief Statistician of India and the Secretary of the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation and the Member Secretary of the Indian Council for Social Science Research. Professor Anand's research has covered a wide range of areas including labor economics, industrial economics, law and economics and econometrics. He received his PhD in economics from Cornell University and his master's in economics from the DSC. Now we have Ms. Sunanda Nayar Bitkar who is the Director of Strategic Planning of the South Asia Division at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, New York. Nair Bidkar began her career as an attorney in the Supreme Court of India, attached to the chambers of the constitutional lawyer K.K. Venugopal, the former Attorney General of India. She has also been an in-house corporate counsel for the SR Group, a global conglomerate, uh, conglomerate based in Mumbai. She has been a member of the Supreme Court Bar Association of India and in 2011, she founded Indus Interface LLC, an international strategic consulting firm based in the United States. Nair Bhatkar earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in History with honours from the Hindu College, University of Delhi, a Bachelor of Laws degree from the Campus Law Centre, University of Delhi and the Master of Laws degree from Columbia Law School in New York. Thank you to everyone on the dais. Now I hand it over to Professor Ram Singh to moderate the panel discussion on India and the emerging economic world order, its prospects and challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Gayatri, uh, for conducting uh, the felicitation part of the event was very impressively. Uh, I welcome everybody to the panel discussion. The panel discussion is going to be about nuts and bolts of uh, the, the outlines and vision Professor Spence uh, laid out before us this morning. So he has highlighted uh, several challenges, several structural issues that makes our future uncertain and also uh, somewhat difficult, challenging to deal with. One of, the, one of the structural issues, structural force that has been unleashed is uh, artificial intelligence, new generation technologies, and also the role of intangible in shaping productivity. These forces are going to have implications not in terms of productivity, but also employment. It is a central issue, central global issue to deal with the artificial intelligence, other new technologies and their implications. And therefore questions arise, how do we deal with issues of intellectual property related to this? And uh, is there is there a need for a global response, a global coherent policies to deal with uh, these issues? In this, if we are able to handle it all right, uh, it's going to generate public good across countries, but it's uh, enab the enabling factors, which is like you know data, it feeds on data images, that also requires collective response, international response. To deal with these issues and related issues, I am going to invite Professor Rohinton Medora and I will request Chair of this session, Professor Spence, to enforce the time. Each one, each speaker will take about 10 to 12 minutes. So, thank you. So. Does the clock start ticking? Yeah. But first, um, thank you all for the invitation. And, and it's a remarkable opportunity to re reflect on things um, uh, both past, present, and future. Um, let me just sort of make two sets of thoughts, and they may not be particularly coherent or connected. Uh, and, and, and there's a reason for that. One reason is, as, as Professor Spence said, there's so much we don't know, but that can't be an excuse for shoddy thinking either. I think we're genuinely, as decision makers and, and as um, academics, thinking through the implications of what is um, a once-in-a-lifetime uh, kind of set of changes. 
So let me talk about what I think those changes might be and simply leave it to you to reflect because it's, you know, it's going to be your thing to reflect on what this means for your life or for policy in general and then make a few reflections on what it means for the connectivity of policy between countries, within countries and with the global government system and all in now nine minutes. Um, as a stylized fact, I would say that the world uh, that Mike described is one in which it's not a world that as economists we wouldn't uh, comprehend, but it's not the one we've been taught mainly in, in economics. Uh, it's a world in which there are high fixed costs, um, high risk of failure, very, very low marginal cost as his uh, protein example strikingly told us. And as a result, when there's success, it is rare, but when it happens, it's incredibly sweet. And in fact, the profits of that success tend to be, tend to reside in intellectual property, which is mostly proprietary. It's not publicly held except when firms choose to release it the way they do, but mostly it's proprietary. And so increasingly wealth is going to be held in the form of economic rent. So you know, think about that. Um, in a world of mainly natural economies of scale, or a mentality of winner takes all, which again is a stylized fact, I don't think that's necessarily always the case. There's two or three things you should expect to see, and I think we're already seeing. You should expect to see first movers benefit a lot. You should expect to see strategic behavior pay off in big ways. I think in many ways, if you want to understand the US-China dynamic, it is driven by their view of how technology is unfolding, among other irritants, but that's really the big one. And in some ways, you should expect economies of agglomeration to work. If you look at where the growth centers have been, they've been in areas where different things come together, not just by happenstance, but by design. And so it's not surprising that we're seeing the resurgence of industrial policy, which was a bad word uh, for several decades. And so everyone's trying to find that sweet spot of convergence while recognizing that government policies often come with high levels of failure as well. And so I think that's something to think about. I mentioned the the centrality of IP, which means that human capital, and especially advanced levels of human capital, of how um, intellectual activity connects with commercial activity and with public action more broadly, is going to be privileged. And in that process, I think universities, which are institutions that often have structures that haven't changed in decades and centuries in some cases, will in fact be evolving as well. Uh, and, and the final point I'd make, especially when we think about the data that underlies this revolution, is that all of this goes beyond economics. And as economists, we should be thinking about the roots of economics in ethics, law, uh, and in politics as well. Uh, narrow economic solutions will not work in something like data, which might have implications of privacy, human rights uh, and, and, and agency, voice, and so many other things that um, economics as a field mostly has kind of understood but not fully got its hand on. And that's something at INET that I know we privilege, which is the, um, the frontier of economics which strays into other disciplines as it should. So that's one set of thoughts. Uh, the, the second thought I'd make in this world is national policy work cannot work in a vacuum except maybe in one or two countries, uh, and even there I'm not so sure, uh, US and China maybe, but mainly the rest of the world will, will, will be working together, or, or will be working in a global governance framework. And I've, so some of us have you know, given some thought and given, done some writing on it. And I'll sim simply leave you with the thought that if we want national action to be coherent and to reinforce other countries' actions at a time when global cooperation is in fact not at a premium, it should be at a premium. Um, I thought the G20 year that India stewarded 
was many steps in the right direction. Um, many of us were pessimistic about global cooperation, but we seem to be kind of crab-like getting in the right direction. Um, and there's things that have begun, but that have to be completed. Let me just name four and then end. Um, just as we had a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was enunciated in the late 1940s and countries spent a decade sign signing up on it, I think as a global community we have to come around thinking about what we mean by human rights in an age when privacy is so different than it was 60 years ago, when surveillance tracking can be used for good and for evil, and yet there's all this tremendous potential for wealth and, uh, and uh, social welfare as well. And so we need to revisit and have almost a global statement on the ethics of new technologies, and that's something that the global community has to be thinking about. Um, just as the UN created the global public good of statistics, the national income accounting framework, we will now need an accounting framework to understand the economy driven by data and intangibles. We simply don't have the definitions and machinery yet to be able to do this. And so we, we will not be able to understand the implications of this economy if until we've got the linkages and the definitions and the statistics right. There's less than 20 countries in the world where we can, where we can even measure some of the things we're now talking about. Third, um, we will need, need to understand that the nature of public finance and taxation has changed. Um, the thrust of economic thinking in the last 30 or 40 years in public finance has been consumption-based taxation is the most efficient. That's probably true. But as increasingly uh, wealth is concentrated through economic rent, we will have to rediscover profits taxes and other forms of, of um, capturing, I mean that in a good way, uh, wealth that is privately created to do public good. I mean, there's some very advanced thinkers who think that all kinds of public services will be provided free by the government because by taxing wealth, I don't know if we, I'd go that far, but I think the balance between consumption and wealth taxes might probably change. And in the process, we should think about how glo truly global firms operate. Now, this is not new to us. In a, you know, when I was in graduate school like you, we worried a lot about transfer pricing and the activities of multinationals who legitimately want to minimize their tax. The current analog is the way digital platforms concentrate their earnings in some countries. And so all the debates about transfer pricing, tax havens, are going to come back and have come back. And I think the G20 OECD tax treaty is a step in the right direction. It's a necessary but not a sufficient condition for success. But for countries that simply are not operating at the level that we saw in the presentation, but still have, uh, are providing the data on which all of this runs, I think it's a legitimate question to say how do we tax digital platforms in a way that's fair to us while recognizing their incentives to operate. And um, the final point I'd make here is, is just a thought, again a proposal. The international architecture that we have currently mainly goes back to sort of the mid-1940s, to Bretton Woods and San Francisco. There have been some evolutions. Um, the GATT evolved into the WTO, the International Court of Justice, but mostly that's the structure. And what we discovered during the financial crisis, and I'll stop on this point, was that the troika of development, global macro and money, and trade was not enough to capture the rise of the financial sector as a sector in and of itself. And so the governance of that sector fell between the cracks, both internationally and nationally. And so we created something called the Financial Stability Forum, which was a talk shop. It has evolved with some teeth into a financial stability board. Some people think the next step is it will become a treaty-based organization and have real teeth so that we fully uh, minimize the risks uh, and make financial sectors resilient. And I will leave you with the thought that with all the things you heard and read about the digital era and AI, do we have the right structures to maximize the benefits and minimize the costs? And my own sense is no. Uh, my own sense is that something like, and I'll call it the Digital Stability Board, because that's 
that's sort of the phrase I use to describe it, is what we need, something that brings together key players, not just countries, but private sector and civil society, exchanges best practice, perhaps names and shames and over time penalizes bad actors and um, rewards good ones. But we need something, and this is what public action and laws are about, that makes a, creates a platform on which good things can happen and bad things are not allowed to happen. I think that's where we are. It's a very exciting time. It's a daunting time. And uh, I thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Medora, for very precise, insightful comments. You know, one of the several perceptive points you made pertains to accounting of data. The accounting of data is at the heart of the issue of privacy and also how the data as a raw material will feed into generation of uh, generative AIs and, and uh, all the benefits that will flow from it. So during the question and answer session, you may want to tell us your thoughts about what is the ownership structure that is most conducive for global good? Should, it be, should data be privately owned by individuals or the corporations, platforms that collect the data? The other related issue is, uh, is how to protect that ownership. Today, there are no effective, clear intellectual property laws when it comes to protection of raw data. It is mostly protected as a trade secret. So the question we should be asking is, is copyright a way to go about it? Are there other forms of recognized intellectual property ownerships that will facilitate a realization of vision that you have laid out? Thank you so much. The, now moving uh, on to, to the panel discussion, the other pillar, uh, other pillar of the vision laid out by Professor Spence today pertains to environmental issues and financing of clean technologies. Also, the distributive consequences across nations of, of cost of pollution and climatic finance. Developing countries versus developed countries are extremely unequal when it comes to their ability to meet with their challenges and the cost that they are looking at. I invite P Professor Rob Johnson to give us international perspective from developing countries versus developed countries' point of view on these issues and cover African continent if possible. Thank you. Well, let me start with something that's a little bit fun. Mike Spence was famous for asymmetric information. Can you imagine a greater gift for INET than to believe that somebody knows it's just not me and he might be that guy? I think you saw a pretty substantial crystal ball in his presentation today, but I have to stick to my balance and my deep beliefs, which are that there is radical uncertainty. There are times when nobody knows and we have to explore. Mike, you might be the, the leader up the path, but right now we are in a time when we can't know everything. And pretending to know, as Robert Nelson of University of Maryland used to write in his book, Economics as Religion, is a false consciousness. And we have to keep that in mind. Starting with China, just for briefly, I would encourage you to look at the writings of Orville Schell and John DeLury, Wealth and Power, because it sets the historic stage for understanding the tensions that are blossoming and exploding between the United States and China. They cite how China was humiliated after being a world leader by the Opium Wars, and then somewhat later in time by the Japanese invasion. They felt like their little brothers were beating them up and, and winning the fight. And that woundedness, after Henry Kissinger and others met with Mao, became apparent 
because it was the U.S. post-World War II regime. But China integrated with America, became stronger, and became stronger. But then there was a certain, I, I think, deep challenge. And you heard Mike talking about it today, about the nature of technology. When I would meet with Chinese leaders back when I worked in investment, they would talk to me about how they thought things like Google, Apple, were amazing. But they were afraid they were also a tunnel to spy on the Chinese. And just to make sure that we're not beating up the Chinese. In recent years, the American government has been terrified of Huawei, thinking it's creating a window into seeing things. So the distrust is there. America would like to run the world, and China would like to have a seat at the head table. And given all the challenges right now, what you might say, the historical echoes are making it harder to create reconciliation. Moving on to climate. I often cite, when I give talks, a woman who was a biographer and a fantastic poet and social commentator. Her name was Muriel Rukeyser. And she said, to understand the world, you have to focus on the resistances. I don't want to be blaming people in the sense that I think when people discovered petroleum and developed oil-based structures and economy, they thought they were just improving things, moving to a higher level of value creation and so forth. But as we've become aware of how carbon affects temperature, the sea, farmlands, and everything else, the fear is building. And I will cite a very, very interesting and creative professor. Uh, he's now emeritus, Duncan Foley, who said, most people want to demonize the oil producers now because they're doing harm to the world and not and we're going too slow, based, at, like Mike said, uh, we're not getting to the place before 2030 or 2050 that all of the scientists and uh, people like the Potsdam Institute tell us we've got to get to. So, uh, but Duncan Foley said, if you think of this as an economist, where are the resistances? The people who own fossil fuels don't want to give away the value. They think they earned it and they built it. But in addition to that, there are many, many businesses, schools, apartment buildings, and so forth, all over planet Earth that are dependent on a system that include fossil fuels. That doesn't mean it doesn't have to change. But those who think we can make the world better off might consider compensating and helping people in transition to change how, what, like say, the move to solar away from natural gas. They might consider reducing the political power in the United States and in Great Britain and perhaps in the Netherlands of major oil companies by giving them a windfall, by publicly buying them up. It might be extreme, it might be radical, but Duncan Foley is applying economics to how do we accelerate the transformation. The, th the other dimension of this is seeing the high debt ratios, particularly in the African continent. My friends at the International Office of Migration are telling me that we will see, it without a major war or disaster, a population approaching 1.8 billion people by 2080. They're in an equatorial region. Subsistence farming is what many societies do before they get to what you might call capital investment and economic development. And right now, there's two problems. Global warming could destroy subsistence farming before Africa can develop, and the chaos and the scope and scale of outward migration could be very disruptive to the world. But the second dimension 
is this technology may make what I'll call the traditional model, which is an underdeveloped country says, we got low wages, we'll put on a little bit of tariffs and we'll figure out how to get some of these plants started up and go with export land growth. But low wages might be replaced by automation and machine learning. And so it may not be a viable strategy out of the starting gate. And many people who I've talked to, I've spent a lot of time related to Africa in the last four years, well, six years, I always punch out the pandemic too. But in the last six years, meetings there, visits there, work with the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, I sense that they believe that the place that could most benefit from the optimism of technology and a new platform, and even Jack Ma in the Luhan Academy in China talked about this, is the development of a digital infrastructure for the, a massive transformation of the economy. And I think there is no country on this planet who is a better example and a better mentor to development with digital technology than India. I think that India could be, how would I say, doing well for itself and doing well for us all in light of the challenges Africa face. I think it's, a, it's an essential thing to embrace. The other area, and this is a concern related to Africa, is because the debt ratios and so forth are so high. Many people are reluctant at this juncture to make further loans, whether through a private entity or through something like the World Bank. But we can't see the rate of return is based on default risk and interest rate and the likelihood you're going to pay it only. The transformation of the energy systems and development, the preempting massive outward migration and accelerating the rate at which the world gets to a sustainable carbon level are all part of the rate of return. So we can't just stop like we're dealing with a private sector entity and not give them capital. And I again want to give applause to India when you led the G20 you really put it on the table and asked us all to see the challenge differently and as one of the highest priorities as you passed the baton to the Brazilians. Finally, I want to talk a little bit with you about the United States. I started by talking about them and the interaction with China. I view Donald Trump's presidency as a symptom of discord in the United States. When you look at what's happened, the data says that starting in 1985, which is coming up on 40 years, 80% of the American people have a lower standard of living than they had at that time. You talk about a rising tide raising all boats. You talk about dynamism. You talk about the American dream. You talk about all of these things. I come from Detroit. I watched my community get crushed. I watched what Angus Deaton and Ann Case called the diseases of despair all around me. Alcoholism, suicides, and everything. It's very cruel. And the diseases of despair are very correlated with where distress is located. In the United States, we have a famous musician named Bob Dylan. He once wrote a song called One Too Many Mornings. I'm working on an adaptation of that song, and I want to call it what, Three Too Many Markets. We talk about we have a democracy in which capitalism is embedded, and that gives it moral clarity. But that democracy now is suffering from a market in the media for coverage where the wealthy and powerful are not scrutinized adequately, where the market that 
how would you say, um, for politicians, survival is dependent on deep fundraising, and you can see in our newspapers the disputes related to the funding and the equivalent of bribery that Supreme Court justices are receiving when one justice's wife is out buying fossil fuel properties while he's trying to stop us from working on climate change. We have centimillionaires in the House of Representatives. The, America's moral troubles are going to propagate around the world unless we make a difference there. And finally, I'll come to, and this is not a criticism of where we are today, it's a criticism of my own country and my own alma mater. The intensity of design and implementation at universities is dependent upon endowments. And those endowments come from very wealthy people and very large, powerful corporations. They are not being scrutinized. Experts are supposed to be for the common good. And experts in the United States are now viewed by the public. And I'm talking about Gallup polls and everything else. They are viewed as marketing agents for the powerful. For America to continue leadership, it has to free itself. And part of freeing itself is healing the despair within the country so we can do the best for the global good and our politicians not be afraid of avalanches at home by reaching out and caring about people beyond our borders along with the people inside our borders. What I'm saying in essence is we're taking off the masks and facing our future. Understanding what Dr. King wrote about, understanding the philosophies like Bhagavad Gita here, which is another thing you can export, is a higher level of consciousness. Understanding Pope Francis encyclicals will help us. As Muhammad Ali once said, when he was asked to come back on stage after giving the Harvard commencement address, and they said, Ali, what is your poem? He said, me, we. The pendulum has to shift towards we, or all of us will be worse off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Johnson. You have raised some very important issues. Actually, you have uh, expanded shifted the frontier of uh, the vision laid out by Professor Michael Spence. You have brought in the political economy dimensions. And you And by the way, sir, I just want to say I'm devoted to the Young Scholars Initiative. It's the leaders of the future and teaching them to carry the ball. I have small children who are going to be led by them. They have to be on course, and that is the, that's the most important part of the mission. And people like Mike are tremendous examples in, in Rohinton, and they're, they're showing them the way to explore, and that's, that's the essence. And I also appreciate with some sense of, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, sense of great uh, responsibility that you have bestowed on India. The problem is that uh, it is not a compliment when it comes to dealing with the emerging world order as a leader. Uh, the West had advantage of growing uninterrupted by climatic finance and the associated cost. China also had a uh, uh, lot of advantage. But now when we, we, we feel it's our time to grow, take strides, then rest of the world and scholars like you are telling us that you have responsibility too. So we take that responsibility that comes from uh, the vision of Indian government. But in your, when we interact with you during Q&A session, we would also be interested in knowing, you know, what specific steps, uh, two, three points that uh, we need to take as a country. Uh, it's, it, your observations were simply great. Uh, really appreciate. Thank you so much. And now I can move I, to can the next. Can I just next. put one little sentence on top of this? 
the point in exploring this is not to demonize anyone. When you pick a fight, you make the other person be defensive and make it unlikely that you'll become partners. But you can't avoid illumination. But it's not about shaming, it's not about demonizing. Yeah, certainly. certainly. That, that message is very clear. Now, moving on to our Indian experts, uh, we, I invite uh, Professor T.C. Anand, uh, who, who was professor here at the Delhi School of Economics, and uh, you heard that he has a very glorious, very illustrious career path, uh, uh, working with the government in different capacities and academics, research, uh, researcher, policymaker. Uh, professor Anand, uh, I want you to uh, talk about him, the issue of inflation and how uh, it's going to play out in Indian scenario. When you do that, I want you to keep in mind one thing, uh, things, all the things that Professor Spence talked about, how, how there is going to be tendency in, uh, in many countries for inflation to be high or if not alarmingly high, interest rates to be high. But there's one force to my mind that uh, has gone a little unnoticed, which is that what's happening in China. The Chinese uh, slow down and crisis caused by uh, real estate uh, housing crisis and its implications for Chinese consumption, which is already low. So that's the, the scope for boosting demand in China by way of consumption or investment is limited. And that means that for them, uh, the only, perhaps, only way to grow out of uh, their slowdown, if not recession, would be exports. And they can, they can revive their exports by exporting disinflation to the rest of the world by dumping commodities. They don't need them, the rest of the world does, and they're very good at dumping. If they do, that will put downward pressure on prices. So for some commodities, we are going to see that there's going to be, because of supply side restrictions, so de-risking strategies adopted by the Western bloc, there's going to be market friction, supply chain frictions, and upward pressure on prices. At the same time, it seems like downward pressure on prices is also uh, something very much on the horizon. In this scenario, what are we looking at? How are are we going to deal with this and other issues like uh, artificial intelligence and technologies, they will pan out in Indian scenario. Thank you, Ram. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, I feel embarrassed sometimes speaking in this very distinguished panel and be that as it may, since Ram has asked me to say a few words, I'll try to do that. Let me start with something and maybe uh, add something to what uh, Ron was saying in a slightly different perspective. Sorry, Rob was saying about in a slightly different perspective. You know, there is a tendency to be afraid of the developments in technology and AI, and you were talking about the potential loss of jobs with machine learning. That that risk is there, and probably some loss will take place. But one of the things which uh, we've seen uh, over many century, decades now, and certainly in the last two decades, is technological change also creates jobs. Uh, I remember I came back from the US to India in 1987, and we were going through an extensive debate on the policy to follow towards computers. Uh, at, at the time I came back, I uh, was uh, carrying a personal computer of my own, which was somewhat unusual in the Indian settings, and the customs people didn't have a rule as to what do you do with it. They had rules for engineers, but they didn't have one for economists carrying computers. Anyway, the fact is uh, we ended up emerging from this much stronger than we did. The, the, the fact that we did liberalize computers, computer imports, and had an open, modern-looking computer policy created meant that we were able to take advantage of what became one of our largest growth engines in the 90s. The software boom, all of that was made possible because we were open to this. A similar 
dialogue took place when telephony was being expanded and mobile telephones came on. And the idea was these were toys for the rich. Actually, what India did with mobile phones was incredible, and it continues to be incredible. Now it's part of our uh, data revolution. But then it allowed the small informal sector uh, of worker to become an independent businessman. So the plumber who was earlier dependent on a shop to get him business suddenly became an independent professional and was able to get customers directly. The, the spread of mobile phones to this community, to the lower income community was huge. Both cases, a technology we feared actually ended up as doing us a lot of good. I'm going to argue that the same is probably true with AI. We tend to look at AI from the production side and Professor Spence talked about it in the knowledge economy, but there is another area where it's going to play a huge impact. Something which some of you would have seen uh, maybe a month or two ago, the Prime Minister gave a speech in Tamil Nadu which was translated in real time using a local lang a language model which had been developed using AI. Government of India is pushing on its own development, so is Google. We have a software, I have it on my phone, I use it occasionally, called Bhashini, which has 24 Indian languages. And the quality of that software is improving literally every day. The possibility that you can translate speech on real-time basis, the possibility that you can translate textbooks for students to use, which is now part of our new education policy that we will teach in the local language, means that our biggest bugbear, which is language, we have been always frightened that we are fractured by language, may well be something which AI gives us a route to tackle. So, yes, the fears are there, but there's also a positive side. Now, but there's a, I'm also primarily a statistician, so I can't not address your concern about the fears. You know, when losses take place, how do they, impact society depends a lot on the structure of the society. Uh, if a 20-year-old loses a job, he can retool himself, he can go back to school, he can learn new skills and come back and find another job. If a 40-year-old loses a job, he's unemployable in the future. Now, where do the job losses take place and how they impact society depends upon your demographic structure. India is still a young economy. The US and China are old economies. And that is really the heart of the difference between way I think we should be doing technology. Their fears are valid, but they're not necessarily our fears. I think that is a message which I want you to keep in mind. Uh, in India, analysts tend to often take the West's fears as our own. What's a problem in the US is also a problem in India. Not necessarily so, and not necessarily in the same way, is essentially something which I would like to say. And I now want to turn to what Ram had said, and I'll try to keep that also brief on inflation. I found a striking slide in Professor Spence's presentation, where he showed that inflation in the US had a very, very strange characteristic. There was a chunk of commodities, particularly in the, in the manufactured space, which has seen flat nominal trajectories, which means actually zero to negative inflation. And there is a bunch of commo items, commodities, which are in the intangible and services space, which has seen very high inflation. This heterogeneous inflation is a new animal. It was not there in the 70s and the 60s when the textbooks on which most of us have learned are inflation, and we are the ones who teach you and very often those textbooks are still in use, uh, talk about inflation. They talk about inflation as a aggregate inflation across all commodities. We don't have that. We have heterogeneous inflation. Now, heterogeneous inflation has a problem in policy. You take an aggregative approach, which, for example, the Reserve Bank does, and raise interest costs. For India, this is now I'm not talking about global, this thing, it has a severe policy implication. It hampers your ability to onshore production. You want to bring production away from China into India, you want to become a manufacturing superpower, you can't do it if you keep raising interest costs. So you have to think about it. Your inflation policy is actually acting counter to your, and this is partly being addressed because 
an understand the journalist here and I'm, since I notice he listens to me occasionally, I'm glad that I, I want to use this to make my pet pitch. We want to rethink our approach to inflation. I'm hoping some of you here uh, will do research on this and try to think about what is an appropriate strategy where inflation is no longer homogeneous, it is heterogeneous and very likely to be concentrated in the intangible and services element. Finally, I think that is the one area of inflation because services and intangibles were so far supply constraints. But AI has meant that those supply constraints are likely to be lifted. Think about the possibility of an Indian communicating, Indian city in say uh, Bengal or Tamil Nadu communicating in, to, in the US with the language and accent of the American. A lot of services suddenly become possible which were earlier constrained for the absence of language. The possibilities which AI has opened up in widening the scope of tradables away from conventional manufacturing to a whole bunch of services is huge. So I don't think we need to be frightened about it. I do agree that we need to work our way with these developments which are taking place in making sure that our institutions are quote unquote in sync. Finally, I will close with this thing. Ram asked about questions relating to China. You know, I'm very scared of speaking about China because one thing which we have learned is every time you make a prediction about China, you're wrong. <laughs> so all of these problems which China is facing is true, but they have proven throughout their history for a remarkable capacity to adapt. So I won't write them off is my way of thinking about it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anand, for this very mm, insightful and I must say amazing remarks. Uh, you specifically, I want to re-emphasize the importance of the research agenda that you have set out for students and teachers at Delhi School of Economics, which is to think of uh, inflation, how to deal with in inflation in view of growing heterogeneity. Uh, so one thing that comes to mind is uh, what Professor Spence talked about, supply side response, the supply, the supply uh, side restrictions partly account for uh, or are going to account for inflationary tendencies. And that means that the fiscal policy has to be, fiscal policy responses also have to be thought together simultaneously with the monetary policy responses. This might actually be the time for greater coordination on fiscal policies across nations. Our focus so far has been monetary coordination. So thank you, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, agenda that you have laid out. Now I invite uh, Dr. Nageswaran. As I said, he is a uh, ear, eye, and mind of uh, government of India. Uh, he, uh, so I invite you, Dr. Nageswaran, to to share with us the vision of government of India, how government of India plans to deal with so many challenges that were put out in the lecture this morning and that have been uh, articulated in this panel discussion, including the responsibility that we find best out on our soldiers uh, as a as a emerge. Some of this we, we are happy to take, but are we quite ready there? How we are going to deal with so many issues? Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, Ram, and uh, also a very good afternoon to other distinguished panelists, Chairperson Professor Michael Spence, uh, distinguished members of the audience, students, and uh, I'll stick to the theme of this panel, which is the India and Emerging Economic World Order, Prospects and Challenges. But before I get there, I probably want to start off by responding to Professor TCA Anand, who wanted us to take note of the heterogeneity of inflation and said he has my ears because I'm sitting here, but I don't work for the RBI. <laughs> and uh, 
also i would like to keep the discipline of sticking to my turf because sometimes when you try to offer advice you end up causing more damage than solving the problem that you have so i would uh, uh, leave it to rbi to respond to professor anand but i do take his point that interest rate tool is a tool for a demand driven inflation process and this is an issue that has been in academia for quite some time uh, whether supply side inflation is best addressed by monetary policy or by other tools etc is an age old issue so that aside i'll speak about india's development path amidst the changing global order and i also take note of ram's uh, request to address this issue of the additional responsibility thrust on us given the global context of climate change while we are also trying to graduate from lower middle income to middle income and so on status first of all we have to accept that the external environment and i think uh, ram alluded to that in his initial remarks external environment for india is not or for that matter other developing countries in africa etc is not as benign as it was uh, immediately after the end of world war 2 or even during the uh, 1980 to 2010 or 20 putting phase that is one point to keep in mind the second the shocks in a uncertain geopolitical environment have become the new norm and i think it's also amplified by the dissemination capabilities of social media and internet and as they persist and we are seeing the most recent example with respect to red sea disruptions you are going to have trade flows impacted transportation costs rising and also with attendant adverse consequences for both output and inflation that is something we need to factor in when we talk about potential growth uh, these have become germane considerations and therefore uh, policy decisions have to factor in these global developments even if we feel that india as an economy with a large consumption share of gdp is can be driven can have a domestically oriented growth agenda it will still be relevant to factor in the global fa- uh, global developments and uncertainties and i think we could be entering into an era of decision making that is to be largely based on probabilistic models and therefore the in the way the indian economy grows in the coming years will have to be different from the previous growth experience this is the context in which we are operating there are six <clears throat> important global trends that are that i'm going to focus on there could be many more but i'll focus on just six of them one is the changing nature of trade even as g20 proceedings were taking place in india last year new trade restrictions implemented in 2023 that could be considered disruptive and threatening to global trade were worth about us dollar 1.85 trillion dollars industrial policies in several countries are putting foreign market access for their local firms at risk and also vice versa their market access for foreign firms at risk these measures cover advanced technology products dual use technologies and low carbon technologies for example nearly 70% of chinese exports of low carbon technologies are covered by beijing's uh, export control this is just by way of illustration and the most commonly stated factors or reasons for restrictive trade policies include strategic competitiveness 775 times invoked climate change mitigation 533 times invoked resilience and security of supply chain 381 times geopolitical concerns 233 times and national security 145 times this is globally not just by china therefore in view of these rising constraints on global trade exporting one's way to growth which was east asia's growth experience will not be easy for india and therefore we have to concentrate on a couple of things one is a rise in sophistication of our products and specialized capabilities that we have in some areas that is why the harvard atlantis economic complexity index is a good barometer of how we are able to diversify and also grow in complexity our products and services next is of course climate policies and the impact that it is having on countries through industrial policies of several countries for example we know about the eudr 
and CBAM, both of which will affect India's exports. And uh, according to Global Trade Alert, the impact would be about at least 5%. And even in the United States, the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act can be considered as a structural break for developing countries in terms of FDI flows are concerned. Because these policies incentivize earlier investors who are looking to diversify into overseas markets to consider their own domestic economy as an alternative. So these policies will have implications for FDI flows, not just to India, but to all developing countries. For example, South Korean companies have been the largest investors in green technologies in the US since IRA was passed last year. According to a UBS uh, EV battery analyst, Korean battery makers will stand to collect an annual subsidy from the US taxpayers of upwards of $8 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act alone. And the spillover effects, therefore, basically it is now attracting investments into the US rather than US uh, sending capital to the rest of the world. And uh, also, for example, again, uh, US, European countries are trying to develop their own version of Inflation Reduction Act. And in Asia, South Korea has its own K-CHIPS Act as well. So therefore, as developed countries prepare to commit billions in subsidies, India and other developing countries face a challenge. We have limited resources and we don't have hard currencies and competing needs for social security, welfare programs and tax bases come relatively limited compared to developed countries. Therefore, how can we match these subsidies and industrial policy programs attract FDI flows because we are a current account deficit country. We also need technology and financial resources to take on the responsibility that Ram alluded to. So in the short run, and I think while we say that, and Professor Anand pointed out that technology and trade have been beneficial in the long run. On average, yes, that is true. And I was reminded of this statement by Mark Twain who said, if you have one foot on an ice bar and one foot on a hot stove, on average you are comfortable. So uh, the problem with the average is that on average we are comfortable and in the long run it will be beneficial. The problem is from here to the long run, how long does it take? We have no idea. And economics is all about uh, trade-offs. Because if we are going to be a country that has to invest in energy transition, then we need to generate our own resources for doing so. And if you are a current account deficit country, and if you are going to attract financial resources, what is the level of current account deficit that the world will accept from you? And therefore, you need to generate enough domestic savings to be able to participate in energy transition. And to do so, you have to grow. And to grow, you need affordable and reliable and cheap energy, which at the moment, unfortunately or fortunately, still is driven by fossil fuels. Because if you take all costs into consideration, including battery storage, including grid stability, and more importantly, land. In G20, the population density is the highest in India. We are the world's largest populous country in, and also in G20, but we don't have the land endowment as other G20 countries have. Therefore, net result is the density, the population per square kilometer is the highest in India. And renewable energy does require enormous amount of land. Just as AI also requires enormous amount of energy, that crypto assets have also taken up. And then what do you do with the uh, 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 discharge or the uh, used but discarded wind turbine blades? and solar panels, which are now filling up landfills, etc. Do we take all these costs into consideration? If we do so, are they the cheapest? Economists and students in Delhi school have to understand that economic decision making is about trade-offs. And it is a trade-off. Why we agree that there is global warming and that is even from India's own standpoint, we need to do energy transition. But when we try to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel imports, do we also therefore make ourselves depend on, dependent on some other source for critical minerals and rare earths? Is it de-risking or is it re-risking of our growth strategy? And 
Today, we have environmental activists trying to stop uh, copper smelting plants from operating in India. And the amount of copper we will need for energy transition from now on until 2050 for net zero will exceed the amount of copper that the world has used since copper was discovered. And getting all these materials out of the earth will require energy again. So where is that going to come from? Have we addressed all these questions? Have we thought of all these questions? So it is not as easy as saying it is win-win. It may well be win-win in the end, but the end comes after we go through the journey from the start to the middle until to the end. So we need to be aware and therefore, what are the kind of goals we, because corner solutions are nice for lectures, but we live, we operate in a world of constrained optimization. And therefore, we have to recognize the trade-offs involved when we talk about energy transition and responsibilities being win-win. It is, but the journey has to be thought through very carefully and there are very important security and economic trade-offs. And also from the Indian policy standpoint, as both Professor Michael Spence and T.C. Anand said, you know, one doesn't write off a country that made a transition from a low poor income country to a middle income country in one generation, and that is China. And decoupling from China is not going to be straightforward. I'll just give you a few statistics for you to focus on. Uh, in terms of the magnitude of the challenge the world faces, when you look at China's involvement in global trade, in 2019, China exported 87 out of 87 HS2 HS products. 1,133 of 1,133 HS4 products. 4,396 out of 4,422 HS6 products. So you can imagine the dominance they have when it comes to exporting HS2, HS4, HS6 coded uh, commodities. They have uh, uh, dominance in these product market areas. And China's exports went to 209 out of 225 countries and it is the largest exporter to 74 countries in 2019. So when we are talking about renewable energy and energy transition, or for that matter, India wanting to become manufacturing powerhouse, diversifying away from agriculture and services, we have to also have a clarity on the kind of policy framework we have with respect to China. That is also a trade-off there, just as there is a trade-off with respect to uh, climate and energy transition policies. And lastly, I would conclude by saying, uh, with respect to artificial intelligence, the same arguments apply that the difference between other technologies and this is the fact that cognitive subjects and sciences can also be uh, replaced by artificial intelligence, which earlier versions of technology were not that you could simply pull the plug. But here, that is not going to be that easy. And in fact, the IMF working paper that I read recently said the one trade that is most at risk from artificial intelligence is economists, <laughs> the IMF working paper. So uh, on that somber note, I will end my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ananta, for sharing your vision and also listing all the challenges uh, that we face as a country. And also, I must uh, re-emphasize as, as an economist. But what I draw a lot of comfort from uh, your observations is that, uh, is that, you know, the pathway to solution to any problem, howsoever intricate, is the realization of uh, the appreciation of the nature of the problem. And it gives me a lot of comfort that the government of India is very mindful of uh, the nuances uh, involved in what we are up against. So our task becomes uh, more challenging because of the politics, uh, uh, the Indian politics is unique. That puts uh, serious constraints, but uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, Sooner or later, I would say sooner, we will be able to make our ways uh, and battle through the challenges that you have listed. Thank you so much.
Now I invite uh, Professor Spence to spend a couple of minutes to... to uh, so we have uh, the next items are that you, we want to listen to you. If we have, if panelists have missed out on something, we have, we will invite some questions from students and uh, then Sunanda will uh, share her, uh, will make her remarks. So you can choose to first invite questions or first share your thoughts. It's uh, up to you. We go by your, your decision. Well, I think we should, um, my suggestion is we invite questions. That's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Uh, let's have questions. Let's have, a, wow, that's, a, that's exciting. Uh, so uh, uh, students with mic, uh, can you, okay, all right, where is the mic at, at the moment? There, can you go to the student? Yes, there. We will come, we will take a round. <laughs> and and uh, the panel discussion, you know, so please keep your question pointed. Uh, ask questions uh, for comments. Today, let's use opportunity to receive comments from the experts. Uh, so my question is to Professor Rob Johnson. Uh, you talked about transitioning to green energies. So how do you see the approach of developed countries, both in terms of government and the private sector, uh, with respect to dissemination and evolution of cleaner energy formulations? to fossil fuel dependent low and middle income countries uh, in the contemporary global intellectual property rights regime uh, since we've seen a good number of hesitancies when it comes to the devolution of pharmaceuticals technologies. So let's take the, the next question. Uh, here, uh, can you bring Mike to Neha there? Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is for Dr. Nageshwaran. So you talked about changing pattern of trade. So my question in this slide, uh, what do you think about geoeconomic fragmentation? Is it, will it be strengthening over time or will it fail away? And uh, what will be the impact on South Asia given that this region is already having the least, uh, uh, the lowest form of intra-regional integration in trade and investment? There was a question there, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is to Dr. Nageshwaran, sir. Uh, do you think that uh, AI implementation is possible without educated human capital, as we have seen with the software boom, that it was possible? So, yeah. Yes, there's a question there from that block. Uh, Hello, good afternoon, sir. My question to Nageshwaran, sir, and our panelists that how we can take uh, steps to minimize the economic disparity as India is one of the uh, leading in this situation, the economic, economic disparity is increasing. Yeah, so for, for this round, last question from a uh, student here. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question is uh, to uh, Dr. Nageshwaran, sir, that what is your view, uh, view on economic growth without economic development? Because we see from last two, three decades that our employment is not generated as we are grow. So, and we are uh, also mostly uh, performing on uh, Global Hunger Index, Global Happiness Index. So, we are growing without economic development. So, what's your view on that? So, uh, there, there are, we can take a couple of uh, more questions. So, in this block, uh, this is fairly satisfied lot here. Uh, so, here. Thank you. So, Professor uh, Anand mentioned about the structure of uh, economy and how it matters when we talk about generative AI. My question is, uh, for developing economies where there is presence of high degree of informality in the labor markets, how do you see uh, the generative AI interacting and can you really catalyze it to uh, improve productivity with that regard? Yes. Uh, yes. Last, uh, last but to third rows here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my question is that recently data came in from Indonesia, Thailand, and Australia, and their consumer morale index what is the, was at the highest. So this would uh, create pressure on inflation 
and how would world banks try to control or the regional central banks would try to control this okay uh, and the last uh, okay so we take two so question here uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rajesh Singh Yadav. I am consultant at World Bank. So my question is to Professor Spence. In the context of an aging population, uh, where retirees are signaling a desire to continue working, is it necessary for a government to set a threshold retirement age in formal jobs? <laughs> so, let's take last question from uh, our sociologist colleague, Professor Sudhavasan. <laughs> Thank you, Ram, and thanks to all the panelists. I, in fact, wanted to ask a question precisely as a non-economics trained person. As a sociologist, one of the things that emerged from the set of comments from all the panelists seems to be a tension between a normative economics theorization and economics in practice, right? Uh, I, want, I was wondering if you want to comment on it, because uh, when the first panelist, Professor Medora, spoke about you know, wealth tax and the possibility of uh, public services being provided for free by the state, it appears as though the response already came that maybe the developed world could do it and the rest can't. And I'm wondering whether there is any, and again, uh, Professor Johnson, you sort of indicated that even in the developed world, that doesn't seem to be the direction that's happening. So I'm wondering if uh, some of these aspects will remain normative. And that's where I want to go back to the issue of environment as well. Because when we do environmental economics or something specialized looking at en environment as a sort of you know, distinct area, then we speak about the we much more than the me. But when we have to talk about fiscal, monetary policy, efficiency, you know, the bread and butter of economics, we have to come back to the we. Uh, so I'm, as a non-economist, I'm just wondering how this gets resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I invite the panelists to, to respond to the questions uh, with a request at max two minutes uh, per panelist. And we will follow the same order. We'll start with Professor Johnson. Oh, that's right. Same order would mean <laughs> 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 Professor Medora would come. Um, let me just address the question of normative and positive and the question on intellectual property regimes. Uh, as we saw with the... I, I think you're right that there's a long tradition um, between positive and normative economics. I think that dichotomy is sometimes forced. It is the job of an economist to lay out options. It is also the job of an economist to sometimes rank them. And uh, I don't think we have the luxury in the real world uh, to simply uh, lay out options and not provide an analysis that helps others rank them. Um, which brings me to the question that Ram posed to me at the, at the end and, and was hinted in, in the question to Ram on IP and will we get to a green transition with current IP structures? Short answer, no. Uh, we saw that with the vaccine, uh, I call it fiasco, uh, after COVID-19. Uh, to this day, less than 20% of sub-Saharan Africans have, been, have received even one shot. And so if you're going to see variants or if you're going to see a next wave, we got lucky this time. We may not get lucky next time. What if there's a game-changing green tech, say in solar storage, cell storage, where because of the positive spillovers, you want everyone to use a technology as soon as possible. That is the opposite of what the TRIPS regime and so on uh, provide. And so I thought the South Africa-India proposal to revisit TRIPS was a good one and an example of the South rising to the challenge that we kind of let down to our peril. There's different ways to do this, by the way, while maintaining the sanctity of incentives. I'm not arguing about socializing, but, you know, look in agriculture. Uh, two generations ago, the existential threat to humanity wasn't the environment. It was hunger and malnutrition and disease. And I'm making, simplifying a complicated story, but the Green Revolution in India and the creation of the CGIAR, which is the International Agriculture Research System, so in a sense, created innovation for the public good. Pets are held in the public interest. And we don't worry as much about uh, 
pure famine and hunger anymore. I think there's different models to innovation that we should think about. With data, there's, we, some of us have proposed data trusts as a way in which you maintain the incentive to profit from data, but also distribute those profits in a sensible way. There's lots of models out there which I would call positive economics. How we rank them, which is a normative question, is something we as a policy, as opposed to an economic community alone, should be doing. But I do feel that economics has a strong role to play here in distinguishing between private rates of return and public or social rates of return. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Johnson, you have a response to... I think, uh, I don't know, as, as I heard your question, Bob Dylan came into my head again. He said, got to change my way of thinking which is his song from Slow Train Coming, when he went through a big transformation in his own life. But it's not just about thinking. It's about the courage for doing. And what I think is happening, at least in the United States now, is that the young people are increasingly despairing and becoming more politically active because they can see we're headed to it's like we're headed towards going off the cliff so i think the danger of climate as distinct from software and other regimes isn't just about an arm wrestle over property rights it's about the fear of death and i'll give you a very awkward piece of evidence in that regard there's a professor at NYU named Douglas Rushkoff. He was called a futurist. And that man was brought to a conference of hedge fund and tech billionaires. And all they wanted to talk to him about was how to build subsistence farms and bomb shelters and whether they could bring ex-military officials to come as guards or would the military officials turn and kill them and take over from them. Why I'm telling you about this darkness is that whether I, when I attend Davos or when I'm in New York, Maine, the powerful people are getting scared and the young people are getting active. So I do think, how would I say? with the constructive energy of the next, you might call it the lighthouse and the next North Star, the kind of work that a guy like Mike Spence does in giving us a vision of what will work can help. But it, it's gonna be a struggle. But I do not see what I will call the conformity illusions among the people under 25 today that I saw in the 1980s uh, when I was in graduate school and, and a little bit after when I was doing some teaching. But I think it, 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 it's a rebellion of the heart. It's not an intellectual argument, but the intellectual arguments become innovative and free themselves when we can see we're headed towards disaster. I do not think you can say in the context of climate that if Philadelphia takes care of itself, everything will be fine. Africa, India, and many other developing regions are essential to the survival of humankind on Earth. So the, the design is a non-starter if it's not inclusive in a global sense. Mike, do you have a uh, place you take it beyond where I went? Uh, towards, the, towards the end. Uh, next, I invite, next I invite Professor Ananta to... I'm quite happy to let Mike speak because that's what I'm doing. But uh, we must give two minutes to Ananta. To, if you want to lend your two minutes, you can. <laughs> But let me make one small point and then I'll give it to Hannah. Uh, I'll be happy to respond to any other questions maybe later. But uh, somebody was asking about disparity and 
I want to take a small class in old-style welfare economics. You know, uh, disparity can increase as a consequence of Pareto improving change. I would not be worried about that disparity where everybody is getting better off and inequality is increasing. Some of that is happening in India. But there is something we forget because in the US the type of change which took place was not Pareto improving. Uh, it could be Pareto improving if a suitable transformation uh, institutional regime for it transfers was worked out because some people gained and some people actually lost and the numbers losing were quite large. Because those institutional regimes for transfers did not get materialize, we are facing the sort of problems which uh, Rob talked about in the US today. But these two types of disparity are different, which is why I will urge scholars to interrogate the concept and the trouble and don't mechanically apply it to your country. Look at the reality each time. I'll stop there. And well, I'm grateful to Professor Anand for taking almost two of my questions and answering them. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, geoeconomic fragmentation, the answer is yes, I believe it will probably be with us, just as uh, we had a 40 year period of uh, global integration. So, there will be some strains and fractures uh, at the margin at least if not more deep if not deeper in the coming these things these things happen in cycles and therefore as an answer to that if uh, intra regional trade in south asia i think it's a good it's a good possibility to explore it may be worthwhile and the co change in context might make it that much more relevant and important than before uh, on the question with respect to artificial intelligence and education i'm not so sure that india was able to achieve the uh, progress it made with respect to software and IT enabled services without education and uh, improvement. So in that sense, I, I don't, I, I don't under accept the premise of the question in the first place. But in any case, regardless of that, we have to invest in skilling, regardless whether, whether or not AI is a factor. Because if you want to increase the share of manufacturing in GDP and hold on to our service exports and service employment in the context of uh, technology helping developed countries to neutralize the cost advantage that developing countries used to have either in manufacturing or in services then it's very important that we invest in the appropriate kind of skilling on economic disparities as professor anand pointed out i mean there is a, there is a relative inequality and there's also an absolute uh, inequality in the sense as long as the incomes are rising and opportunities are expanding in the initial stage of progress if those who are in the center as opposed to the periphery are benefiting as long as the periphery is moving closer towards the center then that is what you need to focus on and that's what he answered can economic growth without development happen? I mean, we are not talking about these two as being antithetical to each other. In fact, it is important without improvement in individual standards of living, without individuals feeling that they have a better future, and so do their children, economic growth becomes meaningless. And if you, if you look at the fact that um, the kind of number of welfare schemes that have increase not just at the union government level but at the state government level as well the amount of transfers that are happening you can go to the dbtbharat.gov.in website and check the number of indians benefiting from welfare programs including avas yojana or jaljeevan mission uh, etc i think there is no uh, there should be no doubt that we have lost sight of economic development as an aspect or as a policy goal, not at all. And somebody asked a question about <coughs> Indonesia and Thailand and consumer sentiments and inflation. If we can't, we shouldn't, if we shouldn't advise the Reserve Bank of India sitting here, there is no presumption on our part we can advise Bank of Thailand or Bank Indonesia on their monetary policy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My colleagues have answered all the questions. Um, but I think this, um, Professor Anand said um, in response to, there's turbulence when you get uh, big structural change driven by technology, always. It's not new. And then I think he said it's fine if you're 20, but you're dead in the water if you're 40. I'm 80. So I don't know what, what happens when you double 40. <laughs> Maybe, maybe the boat sank, or I don't know, something like that. So on this question of retirement, which I think was the one question that was addressed to me, 
I, it's an important question, but I, the way I think about it is something like this. First of all, I believe that policy needs heavily from the center to lean heavily in the direction of making sure the opportunity set for young people is um, expanded. And I live in a country that's very old, very low fertility rate, and the policy tends to focus on the older folks. And our most, this is Italy, I sometimes say when I'm feeling particularly either upset or flippant, our most valuable export is the most creative young people. Uh, and that's something you simply do not want to do. If you want to undercut growth and development, the fastest way to do it is that. So that's a general point. On the specifics of retirement, the, the problem we have is pretty obvious, which is we have systems that were set up for demographic parameters that simply don't exist anymore. You know, so a defined benefit retirement age of 60 to 65 was set up at the time when life expectancy was 70 or something, and now it's kind of 85 and rising, and it just doesn't work. So again, I don't want to get too deeply in the weeds here, but I think what the problem we have here is not that there isn't a good answer, which is to let people retire when they want, you know, with a suitably incentive structure around the retirement savings and whatnot, but that's not the equilibrium we're in, and our problem really is to get from whatever equilibrium we ought to get to from where we are now, and that's hard. I mean, it, that is really hard because, well, when you're growing, it's not a zero-sum game, and my colleagues just told you that when you were getting into real trouble is when you try distribution in a no-growth environment, less than it is a zero, I mean, a zero-sum game. Um, I, don't, I don't despair of this, but I think it's, I would put it on a list of some of the harder adjustment problems that we face, especially in the better developed world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for such an engaging session. Now I invite Ms. Sunanda Nair Bitkar, Director, Strategic Planning, South Asia Division, Institute for New Economic Thinking, to deliver her remarks and a vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's been a long morning, so I'm not going to take long. I just uh, wanted to take two minutes um, uh, to thank everyone. Uh, so I'm Sunanda Naya Bitkar, and I'm the Director of Strategic Planning South Asia for INET, uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And so on behalf of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, um, our Chairman, Professor Rowington Medora, our Institute President, Dr. Robert Johnson, um, and the co-chair of INET's Commission on Global Economic Transformation, uh, Professor Michael Spence. I thank uh, Delhi School of Economics, uh, Professor Ram Singh, uh, the entire faculty and staff, and all of you students uh, for welcoming us here today, uh, on campus today. Um, uh, I would also uh, especially like to extend my gratitude to Professor Anand and uh, Dr. Nageshwar uh, for having taken the time, the valuable time out, to be with us and for affording to us such a rich, um, I think, interaction today. Thank you. Uh, just two more minutes. Uh, I just, um, so I myself am an alumna of Delhi University, having graduated both from Hindu College and the Campus Law Center. And so it's very, um, it's a very warm feeling uh, to be here and to be back. But as some of you might know, but many of you may not, uh, INET is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization which is based in New York City. It is devoted to developing and shaping ideas to create uh, a more equal, prosperous, and just society. So it, con it conducts and commissions research, it convenes forums like this uh, in to exchange ideas, it develops curricula, and it also nurtures a big global community of young scholars uh, that we call the Young, uh, you know, young Scholars Initiative, or the YSI. And uh, that's the group or network into which all of you could be plugged in uh, in the future. 
INET has uh, over over the years also um, uh, garnered a lot of support from uh, influencers, policymakers, and the public as it very carefully uh, incubates new economic thinking within the academy and beyond. So YSI is a community of students, which is young professionals and researchers, uh, and it's totally online and it's a voluntary organization uh, around the world and has more than about 20,000 students um, worldwide. Uh, and you would be surprised to know that over half of them are from the global south. So if you just go online and actually uh, look it up, you would find uh, it very helpful and a and a huge community or a network for you uh, to be connected to. Uh, INET also established the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, uh, which is co-founded uh, by Professor Spence in 2017. And the commission comprises of about 21 experts from around the world and prioritizes issues around climate, financial integrity, technology, education, amongst uh, many others. So with that, I will thank all of you uh, and hope to be back at DSC um, with deeper collaborations in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunanda. It was a great pleasure to partner with you. And thank you, thank you, everybody, for making it a hugely successful event. Thank you. Have a very good day. Thank you, everyone, who joined us for today's discussions. Students in the audience are requested to exit only after the guests have left. Thank you.